welcome to Stillwater's Church today. Thank you so much for being here uh, with us today. I want to talk to you about this thought, how to worship in a way that changes you. You know, that is the point of worship, right? It's not just to get the feels. Uh, it's not just to feel emotional connection or feeling. Now, emotions are important. They're created by God. And emotions certainly can be a part of worship, but that's not the point of worship. The point of worship is for us to agree with God, to have our mind transformed, to surrender ourselves to God. And so today I want to talk to you about how you and I can worship in a way that does that. Now, I think that often we focus on the wrong things when it comes to worship. For example, um, I remember back years ago, uh, I called it the worship wars. There, were, uh, there was a group of churches that thought that you should use the traditional old style of music, um, and that was the only way to worship. There was also another group that thought that the only way to worship God was through Southern gospel music. Anybody know what that is, Southern gospel music? Count yourself blessed, all right? You don't know what that is. But for many, it, it's kind of like country Christian music. And for many, they thought that that sheet music was rained down out of heaven when God sent manna on the Israelites, okay? The, the fact is that uh, they just believed that was the only way to worship God. And then, of course, um, there was completely a new thing, this is years ago, um, using the style, more modern style, using drums and guitars and things of that nature. And there were people that were just like, oh my goodness, this is the worst thing in the world. This is certainly not pleasing to God. Well, that's the wrong focus. Did you know that in the Bible, there are many different styles of worship? In fact, there are many different instruments. You know, there's a lot of percussion instruments mentioned in the Bible, particularly in the book of Psalms. And so if anybody says, well, y'all not playing them drums in church, well... Take that up with God, because he started it in the Old Testament. And some people are like, well, y'all not play those guitars. Well, you know, the Bible says to praise him on stringed instruments. And some people are like, well, the only way to worship God is to be meek and quiet. Certainly a place for that, okay? But the Bible talks about clapping your hands and making a loud noise to the Lord. And, and the point is this, okay? Not your particular style, that's not what's important. I believe, and I truly believe this, that God uses people whose hearts are right toward him no matter what their culture is. I have heard music that I thought was glorifying to God, that brought praise to God, that was music that I didn't particularly care for, a style that I didn't care for. I've heard uh, now, some of you may like the high church music with the pipe organ. Now, it's certainly beautiful, but not my style. But I've seen that bring great glory and honor to God. Southern gospel music, where it's kind of like the country gospel, you know, where they, hey, gather all around, everybody. That's not my style, okay? Um, I, and I hear, I've heard so many. Uh, I grew up in a church that used that style of music. And we had this one guy that every time he'd get up, he'd say, well, I want y'all to pray for me now because God gave me a new song. And I used to think, I don't think God gave you that song because God writes better songs than that, all right? <laughs> and then there are those that, you know, it's the real driving rock and roll style of music. Once again, the style may be something that is particular to your taste, but it has nothing to do, nothing to do with bringing glory to God. This is going to blow some of your minds, uh, but I have been a part of services, okay, particularly in youth services, where Christian rap, Christian rap brought great worship and honor and glory to God. You see, it's not about the style, but it's about what God calls us to in worship that truly transforms us. Now, there's certainly nothing wrong with having a particular style. You may have a style that you like or in a style that you don't like. The church that I grew up in, it was a country church, okay? It was a very unusual church. Um, their music was very, very unusual. Um, in fact, even though it was a very conservative church, uh, they had electric guitar, 
and bass guitar. And I don't know what it is about bass guitar players in churches like that, but they never have any emotion. Their face is always just like, you know, could never smile playing his bass guitar. Uh, Trumpets, banjo. You never lived until you hear a banjo in worship music, okay? Mandolin, dulcimer, trumpet, and my favorite, and I'm not making this up. Some of you think I make this stuff up. We had a guy that played the spoons, all right? And it was, it was actually pretty good, to be honest with you. And I'll never forget what that pastor said because, you know, not everybody's into that style of music, and I'm not suggesting that you have to go to a church like that. Um, you know, we all have preferences, okay? But once again, understand, it's not musical style that causes you to worship God. But I remember this pastor saying this. He said, it's not how high you jump, but how straight you walk after you land that matters. And I think that's true. Um, That church that I grew up in, it was a very, um, does anybody know what I mean when I say camp meeting type of uh, service, okay? Uh, Real old Southern gospel, and we had shouting, okay? And I don't mean like in the parking lot, husband and wife shouting each other. I mean literally during the service. I'll never forget the first time that I went to that church. I was 10 years old, and uh, I was sitting right in front of this older woman, and they got really into the music and everything. And all of a sudden, she stood up behind me and screams at the top of her lungs, Woo! I was only 10 years old, but I literally about jumped out of my skin, and I just turned and stared at her. Okay, I know that wasn't polite, okay? But I'd never been in church before where they did that. And I've, some of you who are new, I'll tell you about George. Uh, George was a member of our church. He was 85 years old. He sat on the front row. He was there every time the doors were open. He had, I don't know if you've ever seen these Sunday school pens that you get for perfect attendance, but George had like, uh, it, it hung all the way down below his waist, okay? He had these pens that he'd wear, and it was quite impressive looking. But George loved to shout, okay? Now, the problem with George is he couldn't shout very loud, okay? He was 85 years old. And he, about the best he could muster was something like this. Whoo! That's about as high as he could get, all right? And we had this one song in particular, and uh, George got really in the spirit, okay? And he jumps out of his pew with both feet landed, and he goes, whoo! About like that, all right? And he didn't stop there. George, on that particular Sunday, started running the aisles. Now, I'd never seen George run before. He's 85 years old. I wasn't sure if he could make it or not. And we had that old uh, style of church had three sections, two aisles, and it would go out in the lobby. It had those swinging doors. You know what I'm talking about? It looked like a bar kind of, you know. So, uh, But George, he's like, whoo, and he starts trucking down the aisle. And I'm like, I don't know. He's leaving. I don't know what's going to happen. And he hit the door, and I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, he's gone. Uh, And all of a sudden, a couple minutes later, he came in the other side. Whoo, whoo, whoo. And he came all the way and sat back down on the front pew, okay? To be honest, I thought George died, okay, because he didn't move after that. And I guess he expended all of his energy. But the point is this. Don't miss what I'm saying. It's not about how, how, how high you jump. It's not about how much you get the feels. It's about how straight you walk when you're in worship worship of God. So today I want to read from a passage that I believe will help us understand what it means to worship God in a way that transforms us. And you don't have to be a good singer. You don't have to be a musician. You don't even have to listen to the radio, okay, Do you listen to the radio anymore, okay, or something on Spotify or on your phone or whatever, okay? I know we don't use CDs and tapes anymore, okay? So if I said you listen to your 8-track, you know that I'm stuck in the 70s, all right? But here's the point. You can be transformed when you worship God. I'm going to read from Romans chapters 11 and 12 today. And in in this passage, the Apostle Paul teaches us something. That in worship, it involves three things. It involves your body, your soul, and your spirit. 
okay? Uh, involves all of you. In other words, a holistic uh, way to worship. Obviously, you can't worship God without a body, okay? Your body, your soul, your spirit. And so what does that mean? Well, I'm going to read in beginning in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And here's what the apostle Paul wrote. He said, I, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. Notice the urgency. I'm begging you. Paul knew the power of worship. He knew what would happen when you allowed God to transform you and get your mind and your attention focused on him. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. I don't know a much more important reason to worship God than that. God's mercies are new to us every day. If that was all there is, that'd be enough, wouldn't it? He said, I appeal to you by the mercies of God to present your bodies. A living sacrifice. Now, once again, this is kind of a paradox because a living sacrifice. You know what a a sacrifice was? It was the death of an animal given to God. So a living death. Now, the interesting thing about that is that Paul did not write that by accident. I believe the Bible is inspired by God. He was directed and guided by God in this. But it's a very intentional thing that I believe the Holy Spirit allowed us to understand in Scripture. That to worship God in a way that he wants us to, there must be a death. The Bible talks about in baptism we die and we're resurrected in Christ. We are dead spiritually and then we are born again through the power of the Holy Spirit, through belief, through faith. And so a living sacrifice. I'm dying to myself. I'm dying to my old nature. I'm dying to my own will. And I'm living in sacrifice to God. In fact, the Bible talks about making a sacrifice of praise. And so in this context, he's talking about how that we worship. He said, let your bodies be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Okay? So he's talked about your body. He's talked about your spirit. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You know that your mind is a part of your soul. Your mind is your will, and your emotions, your intellect, your mind, okay? He says, let your mind be transformed. That is truly the goal of worship, okay? We want to be transformed in our thinking. By the way, do you know what that's related to? You know what it's closely akin to? It's closely akin to repentance. Now, I realize that in our day, uh, people don't like the word repentance because they think it's a negative word. But it's one of the most beautiful words in the Bible. It is one of the greatest gifts that God gives to us, the ability to repent. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, repentance just simply means to change your thinking. That's what it means, to change your mind. It literally means to agree with God. And so if I am going my own way, if my stinking thinking in this world, I'm depressed, I'm discouraged, I'm angry, I'm uh, filled with lust, It doesn't matter what it is. My stinking thinking is getting me down. But God says, you can be transformed. You can begin to agree with me. You can begin to think like I do. You can change your mind. That's what repentance is. It means that God begins to change the way you think. By the way, you can't change anything in your life until you change the way you think. It is the starting point. You want to be able to change. You want to be able to be transformed. You want to be able to have a better life. You want a better marriage. You want a better family. You want to be a better parent. You got to learn repentance. It's letting God transform you through your thinking in the way that he changes your thinking. He says, be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing. That is one thing that you can test, by the way. It's one thing that you can prove. When you begin to agree with God through worship, you begin to get your mind focused on him and he begins to change your thinking. He begins to change your attitude. Then you by proof can point to that and say, look, I used to be this way and now I'm this way. I used to have a bad attitude and now I've got a better attitude. 
I used to be down in the dumps and angry and I was always upset at somebody at the church. But when I got my eyes focused on Jesus and I began to see the beauty of God, the beauty of Jesus, he began to slowly but surely transform my thinking. I was this way and now I'm this way. That's repentance. That's uh, changing the way you think, renewing your mind. He says, by testing, you can discern what the will of God, what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, I'm going to give you just two main points today. I normally give three, uh, but there's some things underneath it that you may want to write down. You can follow along on the Church Center app. You can follow the sermon notes. You can go to the Bible app, Bible.com. Uh, you can follow along there. But I want to give you just really answer two questions. Um, and, and it's really, it encapsulates what we want to talk about today. The first question is this, is why do you worship? I want you to think about this. Why do you worship? Well, we worship because, for many reasons. We worship because we're created in the image of God. We worship because God made us to do this. We worship because every human being is going to worship something. Okay? Now, now are you with me on this? Even a person that doesn't know Christ, that's not religious, that doesn't go to church, everyone worships something. In fact, many people worship the creature rather than the creator or the creation rather than the creator. We often want to worship ourselves. In other words, we put ourselves in the place of the decision maker. We put ourselves in the place of God. And that's what we worship. That's who we worship. Just like Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. For they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Now, the problem there was not with what they were doing, but what they were not doing. They were living life as if God didn't exist. And many Christians live that way, right? Because they haven't discovered what real true worship is. They don't know why they worship, okay? And, and the fact is, I heard one preacher say it this way, that a lot of people, a lot of people who are Christians are what he would refer to as Christian atheists, he said, well, that's dumb. What does that mean? Well, he said, they believe in God. They just don't act like it. And how many of us are guilty of that? Okay. We say we believe in God. We say that God's important in our life. We say that he has first priority in our life. But to be honest, you know, it's one thing to say that something is a priority in your life. It's another thing to show it. I know what my priorities are by what I spend my time and my money on, right? I mean, you can say that this is a priority, but if you don't ever spend any time doing it, I, mean, I can say all I want. Workout is a priority in my day. But if I don't ever do it, it's not really a priority. I may say it is. Does that make sense? Okay, so he says that we worship for a reason. And I wanna just give you this, uh, this thought he appealed to people to get this. He knew how important and transformational it was. But I want you to notice the word therefore. Whenever you read scripture, whenever you see the word therefore, you need to see what it's there for. Okay? So he says, I appeal to you therefore. Now, what is he talking about? Well, he's actually just referring to something he just said that he just wrote. So let's go back up in Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 36 to know what the therefore was there for, okay? So he said, I want you to worship. I want you to do this. And here's why. Romans eleven thirty-three. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom of the knowledge of God. Do you get the importance of that? Do you realize how deep it is to have a relationship with God? of how deep his love, his grace, his mercy is. You see, when we get that, it changes. Oh, the depth of the riches. You know how rich God is? And I'm not just talking about immaterial things. The Bible tells us that God is not like a man, that he has to have someone pay him something, or that he's into anyone's debt. He owns everything. Look at his riches. What is he rich in? He's rich in mercy. He's rich in grace. He's rich in love. He's rich in compassion. 
And when I began to understand, when, when Paul connected this to worship, okay, when I began to understand what this is, it begins to transform my thinking. He said, the depth of the riches and wisdom and the knowledge of God. And here's the point. The more you get to know him, the more you're overwhelmed by him. The more you're amazed by him. The more you worship him, the more you get to spend time with him, the more you get to know him, the greater the transformation in your life and in your mind. And then he quotes uh, from the Old Testament. He said, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid. He's just talking about the awesomeness of God. And when I begin to understand how awesome and how great God is, it changes everything. And then I want you to notice what he said in verse 36. For from him and through him and to him are all things. Now, I want you, I want you to get that. Everything is from him. Every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights. God gives us all the good things that we have in our life. From him is everything. You say, well, you know, I've worked with my own two hands and I've clawed out a living and I've gotten a little bit of savings and I've made some investments and what I have today as a result of my hard work. I don't deny that hard work and saving and wisdom is important. The Bible talks about handling your money in a wise way a lot. But none of this, listen, none of this is possible unless it comes from him. You say, well, I worked. Well, who gave you the mental capacity to be able to do it? Who allowed you to be born in a culture where you could work in a place and earn a living? Who allowed you to have the talent that you have? to do? See, it's all from him, but it's not just from him. He said it is also uh, through him. So in other words, he gives it to me, and it's through his spirit. It's through his power that I'm able to achieve, to do. You see, when you begin to understand that, and you reject the worldly thinking that says it's all because of me. It's all my doing. I did it all. It's all me, 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 me. Then you understand that it's from him and he empowers it. It's through him. But here's where you really begin to be spiritually mature, that it's all to him. You see, God doesn't allow you to increase wealth, for example, just so that you can be rich. Now, there's nothing wrong with being rich. Uh, I hope all of you can be rich, and I hope you tithe, all right? So, but the Bible talks about, and some people say, well, the Bible says money is the root of all evil. It does not say that. It says the love of money, the inordinate desire for money. And I've seen people who were broke as a convict that were greedy, and all they thought about was money, because they saw everything in this world through the lens of a poverty mentality, that there'd never be enough. And I've also seen people that were incredibly wealthy, that were beyond generous. He said, well, I'd be generous too if I had a lot of money. No, you wouldn't. If you're not generous with a little bit, you wouldn't be generous if you got more. Okay, that's just human nature. I hear people say that kind of stuff all the time. They're like, well, I'll tell you what, preacher, if I win that lottery, we're going to have everything we need. Well, I hope you do win it. I hope you tithe, okay? But let me tell you something. If you don't give on what you make now, you wouldn't give if you made millions, okay? It's all from him and through him and to him. And so he says that we worship God and in the last sentence there, to him be glory forever, amen. So he shows us that this is all about worshiping God. Let me tell you some reasons why we worship. We worship because of his abundance. He talked about his riches, the riches that God gives us, the things he blesses us with, um, his abundance, his wisdom. I don't know if you've ever figured this out or not, but God's smarter than you. Now, we often act like we're smarter than God. You ever try to tell God what to do? You ever try to give God advice on what he should do? 
You ever tell God he was too late? <laughs> As if, okay. But his wisdom. We worship him because he knows all. He is above all. He knows more than we do. He has uh, the ability to see more than we can. He knows the future. He knows everything about us. We worship him because of that. You see, worship really must be done in humility, getting rid of your pride, saying to God, you are God and I'm not. You're in control and I'm not. We worship because of his knowledge. He knows things about tomorrow that I don't know. He knows things about the next decade that I don't know. So we worship him because he knows. We worship him because of his plan. He talks about his ways, his ways. God has a plan for your life. Now, I don't know about you, but I've questioned God's plan for my life before. Is this, is this it? This, I've worked all this life and tried and strained and struggled, and this is where I am? This is where you leave me, God? Or whatever iteration of that you want to put in, fill in the blank. The fact is, he has a plan. His ways are higher than mine. And I do well. God transforms me when I begin to surrender to his plan. We worship him because of his righteousness. It talks about his judgments. You ever know, and I know we know this, but sometimes it's hard to feel this emotionally. You know that God never made a mistake. He's always good. And it doesn't matter if we think that his actions are good. They actually are. They're good for us. They're what's best for us. But just like you as a parent, when your children were small, you didn't give them everything they wanted all the time because it would ruin them. Can you imagine if you gave a child everything the child wanted? They'd never go to school. They'd eat candy all the time. And, you know, they start driving a car when they're five years old, right? That is not safe. That is not good. We protect a child from himself or herself. Why? Because they're a child and we're the parent. We know more than they do, even though they act like they know more than you, right? And so we worship him because of his righteousness, his judgment, his power. We, we worship him because he is God. He is all-powerful. We worship him because he is generous. You ever stop to think about how generous God really is? I know sometimes we get stressed out because we're worried about the, the, the car payment or the house payment or the rent or, or whatever, okay? And we get stressed out because of money. Have you ever stopped to think, if you really look at the perspective of what you had compared to, say, just 200 years ago. How many have ever been in an air-conditioned building? Raise your hand. You're in an air-conditioned building now, all right? <laughs> Raise your hand, sleepy. <laughs> Good night, all right? Some of you are you're convinced that you raise your hand, it's going to cost you $500, all right? So... <laughs> You ever think about the blessings that we have? You ever think about how good we really have it? And I, and I realize that we've got to manage things well, and I realize that, you know, we can get all bent out of shape about governments and decisions and all that kind of stuff. I get all that, okay? But we've got it good. We've got it good. God has blessed you. He's generous. He's sovereign. He deserves worship. The fact is, I don't deserve it, but God does. We worship him because of his revelation. I want you to think about this. The will of God, the word of God. We can find the will of God often through the word of God, all right, or hearing the word of God, and we find out what the will of God is. Have you ever thought about this, that when God reveals something to you, how precious that is? It's precious. It's amazing. And we worship him because of that. We worship him because of his grace. We worship him because of his mercy. So that answers the first question. Why do we worship? Why do we do that? Then I want to ask the second question is how do you worship fully 
and effectively. Okay? You got to learn that. Okay? It, it's not going to be something that you just automatically do. All right? You worship God fully and effectively when we follow what the Bible says. And let me just uh, show you what he said. In Romans 12, he said, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. You ever notice that there are a lot of people that they, they try to make it all super spiritual? And I'm not saying you should be spiritual. But like, you know, I'm worshiping in spirit and in truth. I'm not there in body, but I'm there in spirit. Well, what if you treated your meals that way? I didn't actually eat food, but I'm eating it in my spirit. No, you, you don't eat it in your spirit. You go to the table, and if you're like me, you gorge yourself, okay? Because you, if you're going to eat, guess what you got to do? Your body's got to be present. When it comes to worshiping God, he said, present your bodies as a living death. You've died to self. You've been resurrected in Christ. You were buried in him and baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. God says that when you do this, you can live for him. The apostle Paul wrote in the book of Galatians, uh, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He said that the life which I now live uh, in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me. You can't do it on your own. Yes, it is a spiritual thing. Yes, uh, it is spiritual to worship God, but guess what else it is? It is, if you're going to do what the Bible says, you got to do it with your body and your mind and your soul, okay? It's one thing to say, and, and I honestly do believe that the reason a lot of Christians don't take seriously community in church and worshiping God together is because they really don't understand what worship really is. You see... You don't do it just in spirit, but you do it, the Bible says, in truth, with your body, okay, being present. Let me read to you from Psalm 100, and we'll wrap this up. Psalm 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Some of you ought to put that on your car mirror, on your refrigerator, on your computer screen, serve the Lord with gladness. Don't be a grump. Don't be a grouch. Act like you actually have something to be happy about as a Christian. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Wow. Now, he didn't say you had to come before his presence with good singing. Aren't you glad that that's not a requirement? Uh, he, said, he said, come before him basically with a song in your heart. That's what he's saying. You come before him singing, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people. By the way, don't you love the matter of factness that David used when he wrote this, this poem, this psalm? He says, basically, if I put it in modern English, he's God, you ain't. Pretty good theology, isn't it? He says, uh, he has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. If you would just practice that, you'd have a better worship experience. Just being thankful. And hey, look, I get it. The devil will work overtime to get you upset, to get your focus off of God. When coming to church, even. Some of you young mothers, God bless you. All right. Uh, I know that you are overwhelmed sometimes trying to get the kids ready. I get that. Especially if your husband is like I was, uh, that my wife did all of it, and I just kind of sat there and read the newspaper. All right? So, uh, no, I'm not proud of that, but I'm just simply saying that sometimes our attention can be in the wrong spot, right? We're flustered, we're upset, we're angry, we're stressed. But he says... Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good. His mercy endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let, let me just um, give you a couple thoughts in closing, okay? What does God say to do? He said, make a joyful noise in the Lord. Here's the first thing. Worship with enthusiasm. Now, you don't have to be like George, okay? And you don't have to go, whoo, 
and run my aisles, okay? Now, George had enthusiasm, okay, but that may not be you. I want to say this. Not everybody has the same emotional response to things. Okay, are you with me? Some people, some people, they like the calm, the quiet. Our oldest daughter, Brittany, she is not an easily excitable person. In fact, I literally got a phone call from her when she was, I don't know, 13 years old or so. Uh, Brandon, our son, who was around 12 at the time, he had found a, you know those little blank bullets that they used to drive nails into concrete? He had found this, and he decided that what he would do was place a piece of newspaper over top of a freaking bullet and hit it with a hammer as if that was a good idea. And so he did. He was hitting it while his wrist was there, and he hit it. It went off, and it blew his wrist, all right, hit his wrist, and it cut. Fortunately, we found out later that it was not deep enough to sever any arteries, okay, but it messes. We had to go to the emergency room, okay, and this is the phone call we got from our daughter at the time. Dad, yeah, Brandon shot himself. (laughs) I about lost my mind. I was like, what? I mean, I just saw that, you know, somebody, you know, I I thought it was a gun involved. I didn't know what in the world was going on. But Brittany, she was calm. She didn't get get too ruffled. She's like, Brandon shot himself, you know. Now, that, there are legitimately people that that is about the height of their emotional excitement, okay? But it doesn't mean that you can't be enthusiastic, okay? Just because you may not be running the aisles like George did does not mean that you don't have enthusiasm. So the key is worship with enthusiasm. Whether you're one of those guys that likes to raise your hand and clap your hands and sing to the top of your lungs... Whether you're the kind of person that goes to a ball game and paints your face and doesn't wear a shirt, all right? God bless you if that's who you are, all right? So, uh, but, you know, and and look, I've watched on television. Thankfully, I've never experienced it personally. I've seen in Green Bay, Wisconsin, guys that like the Green Bay Packers in a foot of snow go into the Packers stadium with no shirt on and a foot of snow and have, you know, the Green Bay Packers stuff painted into their fat chest and their fat belly. Now, let me just let you know, just in case you're wondering, there are copious amounts, copious amounts of alcohol that have been consumed for a person to be able to do that, all right? Now, doesn't mean that you have to be that guy, okay? But it means you do have enthusiasm. Then you adjust your attitude. Serve the Lord with gladness. Did you know that serving is physical in nature? It's not just, well, you know, we're there in spirit. Well, serving is physical in nature. You actually have to show up. Uh, Serving God, we do it by serving others. Okay? Um, It it is important that we use our gift to serve others. And then uh, participate, get involved. And be present. Smile. That will make all the difference in the world if you just smile. Even if you don't feel like smiling. Can I let you in on a secret? I I love to laugh and I I do smile a lot. But sometimes I'm a little bit of a grouch. And sometimes my go-to emotion is not sadness. It's not even happiness. It's often anger. (laughs) I don't know why. My wife's like, you don't have any emotion. I said, anger's an emotion? What are you talking about, you know? But no matter what your emotional makeup is, okay, you and I can be present and we can smile and we can adjust our attitude. Don't be afraid to be involved. That's a part of worship. You sing with a grateful heart. Worship is not just singing, but singing is certainly a part of it. And when you sing, sing with a grateful heart. You may not be a very good singer. In fact, let me just share this little story with you. My mother, and I love her. She is wonderful. But she's probably the worst singer that's ever walked to the planet. She can't even come close. 
not even come close to carrying a tune. If you ask her to hum the tune to Amazing Grace, whatever came out of her mouth, would not, you would not be like, oh, that's amazing. You'd be like, oh, no, that sounds like a calf mooing at a gate. I don't know what in the world that was, but it certainly is. I see somebody pointing, okay, so. But this is what the Bible says. Make a joyful noise. Now, if you can only make a joyful noise, we're not going to let you on the worship team, okay? I just want you to know that. But you should sing. Even if you're not, you say, well, I'm kind of embarrassed to sing in public. Well, sing in private. Sing in the shower. Sing somewhere and let God know that you have a grateful heart. Submit to God completely. Worship him as creator. Praise him for your salvation. Look, if you'll just start doing that every day, it'll transform you. Express thanks. The more you thank him, the more you're going to be transformed. Praise him and then allow God to renew you. He said, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So what does it mean? Worship involves our body, soul, and spirit. We worship God because of who he is. And we worship him with a thankful and a grateful heart. And it involves every part of our lives. By the way, it's not just in church. Worship, your, your, your job should be a part of your worship. Your family life should be a part of your worship. Your coming to church should be a part of your worship. Uh, every part of your life should be a part of worship. Now, I'm going to give you a little homework, okay? I don't always do this, but this is an assignment for the week, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell God 10 things that you're thankful for each morning. It can be the same things. You can write them down if you'd like. If you're Kind of foggy in the morning when you first wake up until that second cup of coffee. Well, wait till you wake up a little bit, okay? But he, here's what I want you to do. Every morning, you say, 10 things? Yeah, I'm not asking you to, you know, create a space shuttle. I'm just asking you to come up with 10 things that you're thankful for. We all can do that, right? So every morning, thank God. I could just sit here and just blurt them out, okay? Things that you can be thankful for. You can be thankful for your health, your uh, life, your family. You can be thankful for your children, your spouse. You can be thankful for salvation, for forgiveness, for God's grace, for God's mercy. We could just go on and on and on and on. But just start your day. Every morning, 10 things. God, I'm thankful for this. And if you'll do that, then God will slowly but surely begin to transform you. And by the way, do you know that there is a part of transformation that is instantaneous and permanent when you get saved. But there's also a part of trans uh, transformation that is continual and progressive. Okay? I wish that the moment you got saved, you didn't ever sin again, didn't ever have a bad attitude again, didn't ever lose your focus again. But that's just simply not reality. And even as a pastor, if I can be honest with you, Sometimes I get full, 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 but I leak. And so do you. Sometimes our mind is transformed. We're so excited. And then before long, we're like, oh, no, it's so bad. We leak. And so let God transform you daily, slowly, but surely, and absolutely. He will do it. Sing with me. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. One more time. God is so good. God is so good. God is so good, he's so good to me. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, today, online or in the room, maybe you need to pray to receive Christ. The greatest trans transformation comes when you surrender yourself to God by faith and you ask him to save you. 
And you'd say, Pastor, I'd like that. Why don't you pray or say something like this to God? Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, that you died on the cross and rose from the grave. And I'm asking you to give me the faith to save me. I'm just simply asking, because you said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And God, I'm asking you that today. 